powerful, became a powerful council for pushing mining interests in, in, in South Africa. Tourism as well, a number of institutions, powerful institutions, that pushed tourism from 6% uh, of GDP, and we were having a GDP discussion, but let's not discuss that now. 6% of GDP to 10% of GDP. In other words, 10% of South Africa's income now comes from tourism. And when you look at what they did to get there, a lot of it was about saying, what are the institutions we need to make the politicians understand, to make the world understand that we're a tourism, uh, a, a to we, we are potentially have gold in our tourism. So um, well, that's what I meant by moving in to the political mainstream to win, to win hearts and minds. The other side that we must also have, I think, to build strong institutions is we need a popular consciousness. And in the developed world, strangely the developed world who have long ago destroyed most of their biodiversity, they have a higher consciousness around uh, biodiversity often and saving biodiversity often than those of us who do have high diversity biodiversity. Uh, and it's, I was interested in our colleague from Ghana's comment which said that many of people in Ghana uh, rely on biodiversity for their well-being. Uh, in some countries in Africa, particularly South Africa is a big example, but also in Zimbabwe, um, forced removal of people from the land over the last hundred years has actually divorced people from nature. And the irony it is that we are a hundred years old this year, Sanbi is a hundred years old, but it's also a hundred years since the, 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 the land acts, the, what they call the native land acts, where they removed uh, native South Africans from, from the land and, put, and created the homeland areas, uh, areas with very low productivity. In Zimbabwe, the, they created what they call crown land and communal land and all the native Zimbabweans had to move from the crown land and be pushed out of the communal land. So unlike places like Ghana, I think, Kenya, I think to a certain extent, had also got some land alienation. But places like Ghana that didn't have the kind of colonization that we had, um, there's a much tighter link between nature and natural resources and people's livelihoods than in South Africa. In fact, in South Africa, at one point, the research showed that everybody was in the money economy. There was no one out of the money economy. And that's because we had things like hut tax, where people, where, the, where it was enforced that they would, people would have to pay a hut tax which mean they needed to have money, which meant they sent their fathers or their sons to the mines to make money. And that was already in the 30s and the 40s. So we're unusual in that way. And so um, even though we have the third highest biodiversity in the world, um, we still haven't sufficiently overcome that for people to understand the link between this, this great legacy and heritage that we have in nature and in biodiversity. And if you don't make the case to the majority of people, you will not be sustainable. You sit in your tower, you churn out the information, majority of people will not read it, it will not impact on their lives. One day when the difference between very rich and very poor South Africans get too much, and all those people rise up and sack you, they will also sack biodiversity because you haven't made the case for the importance of it. So it's, it's uh, in South Africa, it's, uh, it's an interesting 
an interesting conundrum that we have to overcome. Many countries not so, I think, that you could make the case better. So we concluded, I concluded in that research I did for, for, for the paper I gave for, to CBD, that a strong, well-run, well-positioned, and well-connected, and a little bit agile uh, institution seems to be key to the success of, 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 um, of some of those successful sectors. And so then maybe we could copy that. Um, and so I wanted to just talk a little bit more about, about Sanby on this as a case study. So th this is new and kind of like got thought out in the last few days about how to represent the kind of cycle that we think are the key elements to creating a sustainable institution for biodiversity as well as therefore biodiversity informatics. So I've talked a lot about making the case for the value of biodiversity and in my view it doesn't matter how much money you have how many researchers you've got. If you don't make the case for biodiversity, the value of biodiversity for the economy and for the government priorities of the day, you will not be able to provide, have an institution. And that we've been working on making the case. I'll give you some, give you some stuff that we've been working on, on how do we link our work much closer with the priorities and the imperatives of, of, of a developing country like South Africa. Then you need vision. I think you need to see the future or you need to imagine the future a little bit. And you need to bring people along with you. So when we embarked, for example, on on b the biodiversity information side and as I will show you that it's in our act to lead that for the country biodiversity information and access uh, we need to get we needed to get people like Les convinced that there is a 10-year vision that there is a future and what is it that we we need to get his buy-in as a major um, uh, institution that produces some of the best information in the world around birds and other animals uh, and so you need that 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 kind of skill set as well then the other thing I thought of is you know you need little projects little projects that show value little sparkly baubles on a tree that you do the science generation, you think about the, informa the, the, the way you are going to do the information and the report and you, and you showcase the importance of it. Because human beings don't like to deal with a, th a whole field of something that they don't know. They'll deal with one thing that they don't know and you explain it well and then you say it actually can be compared to, to, to everything else. So for example, uh, when I went to GBIF uh, three times ago I think and Jorge Soberon made a talk, the, the guys you're going to hear from Conabio and what he did was to show us malaria and the Anopheles mosquito and the overlay of the incidence of malaria and the overlay of the species of, do you remember that, mosquito and suddenly my eyes thought wow this is a way to show the link between human health and the work we do and it was so, I was so awestruck by, by that presentation and that's what Conabio, I think, has managed, and that's what we hope we are doing, is to make that link so that people can see why do we worry about 
the, the, the population dynamics of the Anopheles species? Why do we worry about it? I mean, is it just a bunch of nerdy scientists sitting on a microscope? But in fact, the kind of information that came out of that showed health ministers, for example, in Ghana, in Uganda, what they must be looking forward to and how they must be maybe setting some research money aside or even improvement of clinics or maybe a rollout of vaccines or whatever. It was totally fascinating. So that issue about projects to showcase is really important. The other thing that Sanbi does, and it can be a very unpopular thing, and so Les, who is one of our, and our CSIR colleagues, will close their ears here, <laughs> was to identify where the major national source of funds are. And in our case, it's the National Research Foundation. And go and court them, basically and say to them, why don't you let us set the agenda for biodiversity research for everybody in the country? And with the result, it's taken us a few years, but with the result, this year, we start with the fundamental biodiversity information project, which used to be a little pot, a pot of money that NRF used to send to universities. And they've said to us, you can have it. But we didn't take it. We said, no, we don't want to take it, but we want to influence it. We want to be the institution that influences it. So with the result, we now set the agenda for biodiversity research for the country. So at the minute, we've much hated by everybody, but it's understandable. It'll go through. We'll, you know, we, will, we will be fine. But Essentially, we're saying, if we are doing the national biodiversity assessment work, and it takes us five years to do that, then we need a research agenda of our state institutions that answers the key questions in this book. And of course, scientists scream and shout because they, they want to do their own thing, and you know, but in a developing country, scientists can't do their own thing. And in an economic downturn period, even less so. So it's an important uh, thing to get on to be the agenda setter. But it also takes time. So our Natural Research Foundation that provides research money to institutions, universities, in the terms of biodiversity, we shape the agenda of that research now, after these years. The other important thing is to do prioritizing. We sit on the highest biodiversity in South Africa, in Indonesia, in Brazil, in the world. So the issue about prioritizing um, uh, the work that you do and the information that you provide is, is really important and it's an ongoing basis it's not something you do today and you'll have it for five years it's almost constantly looking at what's important so for example cycads now is a, is a species under threat and so we are focused on cycads and that we, we've done that not because of human well-being but because we feel that because it's a threatened species, we need to focus on it. So the issue about prioritizing, and it's a very difficult thing, prioritizing. Everybody th has a view about prioritization. And so it's not just a one bullet here. It's a, it's, a, it's a constant discussion. And then showing economic and social value uh, constantly will be an issue for us. In my view, and I, I'm talking about my view, we had a long argument last night. In my view, an institution, a, bio, a biodiversity informatics institution is not an academic institution. You can get the information from academics and you can have partners, but a bio, biodiversity informatics institution must be 
showing economic and social and planetary and sustainability value. Um, and it, and it's a, 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 you have to concentrate, you will not be able to create an institution. You will compete with academic institutions. You must be careful not to play in the academic space, but to be getting information from them, nurturing them, supporting them, and even guiding them if you've got enough scientists in your, in your midst. But in the end, you mustn't compete with academic institutions, in my view. And it's quite interesting, we had a long debate about that. The next part of the cycle is you must have impact. Uh, if, 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 if you don't have impact, and you must find opportunities to show impact. Um, we've just done, we've just had the first national development plan. And I think the big thing we got into the national development plan was the notion that ecological infrastructure is an asset that we can use to use resources more efficiently. So it's in the national development plan and it requires that impact and people can see it and all of a sudden the issue of biodiversity is, is higher. And then you need to obviously monitor and report. Um, and the reporting, yes, we are on the African continent, one of the first fastest mobile telephony uh, continents. So there's huge thinking and thought around getting, popularizing, getting information through mobile telephony, uh, which is important. But in the end, we're a cu country that reads. We're a continent that reads and producing a report that is understandable by more people that can be on people's coffee table and on their desk is actually one of the ways of keeping that vision alive. And then of course, the value, it's like stepping on a chain, on, 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 a, on, a, on a wheel. It then creates a better understanding of the value of biodiversity. I have to move faster. So I talked about the Fundamental Biodiversity Information Program. I talked about the, the fact that we are one of the highest uh, biodiversity in the world. And I want to use this little line to open a, a concept. Uh, yes, we have the highest biodiversity in the south. In a way, people in the north if they had high biodiversity, which they don't, didn't tend to have because it's much colder, what they do did have, there's quite a lot of destruction. I think that we are in the South, in South America and in Asia and in Africa, the custodians of global university, uh, global biodiversity. So this notion of us paying dues to GBIF based on our national biodiversity capacity or national GDP capacity is something that we need to turn on its head in my view. Be because it's global custodian role. We, we play a global custodian role. So for example, when elephants get culled in this country because we are managing elephants within our zoos and within our conservation areas. And people come to us and say, how dare you cull the elephant? I think they have a right to say that because we are custodians of these elephants for the globe. The only problem is that when it comes to paying the money for managing these elephants, they're not saying anything. But there are a lot of views about it. They have a right to have a view because as global citizens, we are, we are playing a global role in custodians. So it's a strange kind of back foot that we have here in, 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 in the South, that we kind of back foot because we think, you know, we're developing and we back foot because we don't have money. But in fact, we, we're the custodians for all of this, for the globe. We should be paid for that, not the other way around. <laughs>